welcome back to another episode of Titans of Food Service, where we delve deep into the world of food service, having the conversations around innovation, creativity, and empowering stories with the movers and shakers who have made it to the top. I'm your host, Nick Portillo. And today we have a special guest whose remarkable career span multiple industries and a wealth of experience. Brian is truly a titan in the world of business and sales management. Brian Will is no stranger to the world of entrepreneurship, having embarked on a journey that led him to become a serial entrepreneur. His track record of success speaks volumes, having co-founded and led seven highly successful companies across diverse sectors. These ventures reached a staggering valuation of over half a billion dollars at their zenith, showcasing Brian's exceptional acumen for innovation and growth. Notably, Brian is not just a business visionary, but also a prolific author earning the esteemed distinction of being a two-time, yes, two-time Wall Street Journal best-selling author. His insights and wisdom have been shared in his writings, offering invaluable guidance to aspiring entrepreneurs and industry leaders alike. But Brian's impact doesn't stop there. His expertise extends to revitalizing companies ranging from startups to Fortune 500 giants and propelling them to unprecedented heights. He has masterfully orchestrated turnarounds that have resulted in billions of dollars in sales, proving his ability to transform challenges into remarkable opportunities. What sets Brian apart is his ability to grasp agile processes and principles from a multifaceted perspective. His profound understanding spans from the development team to the executive board, making him a true bridge between vision and execution. Today, in addition to his illustrious career, Brian's passions have led him to the vibrant food service industry. He owns a flourishing chain of restaurants in the dynamic Atlanta area, adding a unique flavor to the culinary landscape. Beyond that, he's engaged in the world of real estate, managing both residential and commercial properties in Georgia and Florida. But his contributions don't end at the business realm. Brian's commitment to his community shines as he serves on the city council in his hometown of Alpharetta, Georgia. His dedication to the betterment of his surroundings mirrors his commitment to success and growth. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready to dive in the insights and wisdom of a true visionary as we delve into the journey, experiences, and wisdom of Brian Will on this episode of Titans of Food Service. Let's go ahead and welcome Brian. All right, Brian, welcome to the Titans of Food Service podcast. I'm so excited to have you on here today. Been looking forward to our conversation. I read a lot about you and and your success in the world of business, and I know you have a lot to share today, and and I know it'll resonate with a lot of the people listening in. So thank you for joining. Nick, this is awesome. I I can't believe I'm on a podcast called Titans of Podcasts. I don't, I want to know if that makes me a Titan now, because <laughs> I've always wanted to be a Titan. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> I would definitely categorize you as a Titan, no doubt. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> so why don't we start off with you've you've started and sold businesses, maybe like a, a background so the listeners can understand kind of your history as an entrepreneur. Sure. So my history goes back to basically failing out of high school, joining the military, got off active duty, couldn't hold a job, got fired as a waiter, got fired as a busboy. I mean, literally, I couldn't hold any job of any kind, so I figured I might as well start my own business. So first business was landscaping, relatively successful until it failed. Mm -hmm. and then I got into the insurance industry, uh, sold my first company to a venture capital group in 1999. Second uh, company I sold to a venture capital group in 2006 was also in the insurance industry, technology platform. Did another company in online marketing, which we sold to a private equity group in 2008. And then went on and did consulting in sales and management consulting for Fortune 500 companies. And along the way, did what is a cliche when people sell companies is I thought, you know, I always take my employees out to happy hour every day. I should buy a restaurant. That's what I should do because clearly I'm a good business guy. I can run a restaurant. So I bought my first restaurant, and I think I said I've had as many as 15. I currently have four operational, two under construction. Written a couple of books since then, got into politics in my local hometown, I got into the real estate business, and so I'm kind of all over the board these days. But still, still have my feet in the in the in restaurant industry. Um, yeah, a lot of ups and downs there. Yeah, I can imagine. If we can go back to your time starting up your landscaping business, what did that look like? You know, it was I used to call it me a truck and a shovel, uh, getting started. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that's that's what I was. And I, but I built it up and I built it up and then I decided to franchise it. And then I had seven franchises. Um, and then due to a series of mistakes, you know, you learn the most from mistakes in business more so than you do your successes a lot of times. Uh, lost that company when I was 29 years old, I think, um, and had to start all over again. But when I lose, I learn, and I learned a lot in those failures. So that's when I started my next company selling insurance and then turned it into a direct-to-consumer call center platform and sold it to a venture capital group. So uh, I've been in multiple industries here. You mentioned that you learned, even though you lost the business, you learned some things from, from that experience. What are some of the things that you did learn? Well, so in my first business, the, one of the first big things I learned was, number one, do not have the majority of your business coming from one client. I had 90% of my business with one client. Mm -hmm. When that client fired me, we were in trouble. And unfortunately, I had all the overhead, all the expense uh, of running a company but I only had one client. So when I lost a client, I lost all the revenue and I still had all the expense uh, and we got in trouble because of that. The second thing was I was living beyond my means in that first company. I was a young kid when I started at 21 and I'm now 29 years old and making a little bit of money and had a nice car and motorcycle and Mercedes and I had a place at the beach and unfortunately my personal expenses were 101% of my income. And once again, when the business went down, so did everything I had personally. And so I ended up losing pretty much everything. And uh, today I don't make those mistakes. In business, I carry uh, big cash in the back to take care of me. I do what's called secure your lifestyle at different levels as you start to build. We diversify our income base. We diversify our customer base. A lot of things in those two big failures that I've carried through. Interestingly enough, my first restaurant failed. Uh, I told you I bought that restaurant and... I had it for about a year, and after a year, it had lost about $75,000. And I was like, okay, this is not fun, uh, so what am I going to do? So I went and bought four more because, you know, when you fail, you quadruple down and try it again. <laughs> so, Of course. I bought four more, got rid of the first one, and interestingly enough, they were super successful. Now, mind you, they'd been around for a long time. They were a semi-little brand in our area. And so then I thought, well, heck, I'm running four companies here. I am clearly a restaurateur. I know what I'm doing. So I'm going to go build a couple. And so I built one, and then I bought one and remodeled it and turned it to a different brand. And both of those failed. And this is when I learned my first big lesson in the restaurant business is unless you are a brand or you are a location or destination, your chances of success are really, really tough. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a big one we learned early on in the restaurant business. Uh, with those failures and then went on to buy and build and sell more and today we're building a small brand here in the Atlanta market called Central City Tavern so I've had a lot of ups and downs in the restaurant business you seem to be someone who is comfortable with taking risks uh, coming out of high school you know jumping right into owning your own business and you know owning multiple businesses you know getting into the restaurant industry which it's risky for sure to run your own restaurant, as you know. What is it do you feel that, how are you able to do that, take on that amount of risk each time? Yeah, so early on, I didn't have anything to lose. I always used to say, I, I don't have any risk. I have nothing to lose. If I go bankrupt, what are they going to take my, you know, 20, 15 year old truck with 150,000 miles on it? There was no risk. I was yeah. risking a piece of junk truck for another piece of junk truck, as I like to say. As I made money, after I sold a couple of companies in venture capital and private equity, and now I'm, I'm, you know, I would, I would say, really well off. Uh, today I don't risk principal. I only risk income, and this is my risk tolerance. So I know if I'm going to invest in something, whether it's a restaurant or a business or an investment, I will risk up to my income level, but I will not risk my assets because I know I can make more money. As long as I'm only risking the money and not the assets, I'll still have the assets and I'll be able to make more money. So. My risk tolerance, while I have it, is limited to whatever that bandwidth is of income. Sure, that makes sense. You know, coming out of the 2020 COVID pandemic, uh, being in the food service industry, I, I felt at the time, I was like, a lot of restaurants are going through a very tumultuous time, many going out of business. And I could see a lot of entrepreneurs from other industries getting into the restaurant business, starting their own restaurant, and, you know, maybe picking up where somebody left off. 
do you feel owning a restaurant, the, the skills you learned in your prior companies in separate industries, those skill sets are transferable into the restaurant business? So here's what I teach in business and what I do, and I'm, I'm a tactical business coach, right? I can tell you that I don't know anything about running a restaurant. In my 12, 13 years, I don't know what a seating chart is. I don't know how to ring anything into the POS. I don't know how to cook. I don't cook in my own house. Never <laughs> use my oven downstairs ever, not once. I don't know how to bartend. I literally am useless inside the four walls of that restaurant. What I know how to do is run a business. And when we take, and I, see, I hear people say this all the time, well, restaurants are tough. You know, that's a tough business. And I, mm -hmm. I challenge that. Because it's not. It's not any tougher than starting an ice cream, a, a, a tie shop or a clothing store or a retail shop. It's not any different. The challenge we see in the restaurant business is, though, you're very visible, mm -hmm. right? Because my restaurant's visible to the public and people either drive or walk by it every day. So if it fails, everybody sees it. Not everybody's down at the mall to see the shoe shop go under because you're not out in public and people are walking in, you know, about 3,000 people a week in my Alpharetta location. So I don't believe that the failure rate is that much higher in the restaurant business. I will tell you the reason most restaurants fail, however, is because they're started by chefs who don't understand business. They're okay. started by managers who don't understand business. Or they're started by people who don't understand business at all and just think they're going to start a restaurant and have fun, which is my first one, by the way, and hang out and give out drinks at the bar and, and it's just going to be a party. And they don't really understand the business behind the restaurant, right? I tell people all the time, my restaurant managers know how to run a restaurant, but they don't know how to run the business. Mm -hmm. I know how to run the business, but don't know how to run the restaurant. And that's the difference. So yes, business lessons are the same no matter what your business is. You have to understand core metrics, financials, P&L analysis. You have to understand trends. You have to understand everything about how to run a business more so than you need to know how to cook a hamburger and make a Jack and Coke. Sure. You, when you look at the metrics, what are some of the metrics that you are tracking and looking at? Yeah. So we call it the four metrics. So okay. there's really, there's four major metrics in the insurance, in the insurance, in the restaurant business. It's food cost over food sales, liquor cost over liquor sales, labor over gross sales. Those are the big three. And then it's rent divided by revenue. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we figure out those four metrics, we know that, that, as long as you have a certain level of revenue that exceeds your OPEX, and your OPEX is different in any restaurant. So when we go in and do a restaurant analysis, the first thing we look at is your basic OPEX, right? This is your fixed expense. Then we look at your variable expense. And then we look at your food, liquor, labor, and rent over revenue, right? Mm -hmm. I can have great food, liquor, labor, but if I don't have enough revenue to overcome OPEX, I'm going to fail, right? Right. So we have to have that minimum OPEX or minimum revenue. If we have the minimum revenue... As I like to say, in, in so one of the location right up the street from me, I got to do 1.2 million to break even. That okay. means if I do 1,199,999, I lose a dollar. And people come in on Friday night and they're like, oh my God, you're busy. You're making so much money. And I'm like, no, I'm really not. I've lost a dollar this month, right? On top of that 1.2 million, I have about a 50% mar profit margin on every dollar above that because now I'm only dealing with my variables, which is food, liquor, labor, right? So... Everything above my break-even point, and most people, most people that own restaurants don't know that break-even point, everything above that is profit as long as your margins are within tolerance. Mm -hmm. So when we look at a restaurant, we do a historical P&L, look at your food, liquor, labor, your revenue over rent, find your break-even point, and then we can predict what's going to happen in your restaurant. You'd be surprised how many restaurant owners have no idea what their P&L looks like. I can imagine. I mean, zero. They don't even keep them. I, I can tell you of restaurants I've gone into buy, and I'm like, give me your P&Ls over the last 24 months, and they're like... I don't know what that is. <laughs> I met a guy recently and he owns a business and, and <laughs> what his business does is he teaches dentists on how to run a business because yep. dentists, they go to school to learn how to, you know, clean teeth exactly. and do what they do, but they have no idea what it takes to run a business. So he has a formulaic process he uses that dentists can buy and just follow along. Yep. And basically he's setting up a P&L, he's setting up core metrics, you build the percentage you know, we call them little alleys. I, I, I liken it to bowling, right? You ever gone bowling with kids? You have kids, by the way? No, I don't, but I have okay, before. Well, well, when you get kids and they're young, you put the gutter guards up, right? Yep. And so the kids throw that ball, and as long as it's bouncing around the gutter guard, it'll bounce around, it'll go down, it'll knock the pins down. So when we figure out what your core metrics are, we set up the gutter guards, and as long as you stay within those gutter guards and those percentages, you're going to be profitable, right? Mm -hmm. Just like a kid bowling. If you get outside of them, that's where you're in trouble. 
Yeah, for sure. When you look at the food costs and your liquor cost, is it formulaic? Is there like a percentage that of costs yep. that you're looking for for each one? Yep. So, and this is going to be relatively generic. It might be different for a super high end restaurant serving a $200 steak, but for the majority of the restaurants out there, 28% food cost is where it needs to be. 28% okay. food, 4% paper. That's a generic, that's a relatively stable number. Liquor costs are going to come anywhere from 18 to 22. We run 22 on the high end only because in my restaurants, we serve badass drinks. So I asked people, Nick, let me ask you a question, Nick. Here's a question for you. Okay. Are you, you're married. Are you married? Yep. Okay. So you're married. When you and your wife go out, do you know where the bar is that you can go to and they have badass drinks versus the bar you go to where it's like a half a glass for $14 and it's got like a shaved peel twisted on on the top? Yes. Um, yes. Yes, I would say. You I, know where you're going to get badass drinks. And so right. we actually trademarked badass drinks. I like People that. People know when they come to my restaurants, they're, it's going to be a little heavier pour. It's going to be a lot more ice. It's going to be full. It's going to You're going to go, wow, this is a badass drink. Um, and so we run a little high on the liquor cost because I know people come to my restaurant for that. Throw in my super comfy overstuffed seats at the bar and people sit there and watch sports for two hours <laughs> drinking away and we're making a killing on the liquor. Yeah, smart. What so, about in, in terms of profitability of a restaurant? What do you, what about, what do you see there typically? So it's interesting. Uh, I just did a, a podcast on this the other day and I said, most restaurants are running 10%, maybe 11, sometimes less. If you're running less than 15% net in your restaurant, you're doing it wrong. And if you're doing it really well and your, your revenue is significantly above that break, even you should be in the 20% mark. So 15 to 20% is where we would target a restaurant if we were going to do consulting with them. Now, they got to have the revenue base to do it. Without the revenue, there's no way to get it. But if they have the revenue, I would say if you have enough revenue, I can fix any problem. And I can get you to 15 to 20% profit easily. It's just yeah. a matter of managing the metrics. I had somebody on the podcast um, a few months back, and he, he also owns um, a chain of restaurants. And he said, volume covers everything. That was his, yeah. his slogan. And, you know the uh, challenge with that, though? The challenge with that, Nick, is that volume covers everything, but it also covers up your weakness as an operator. Hmm. Okay? And so you made this comment a little bit ago about COVID. You know, when COVID hit, we, we laid off 150 employees in one day, right? We shut down six locations. What you saw in COVID, not just in the restaurant business, but especially in the restaurant business, is it washed out the weak operators, they didn't have cash flow. They didn't have assets stacked up. They had too many bills. They weren't operating profitably, and they, they just weren't able to make it. If you're running a good, solid, profitable uh, operation, and you've got enough reserves set up, and you've got all your stuff set up correctly, you will not get washed out in a COVID like a lot of folks did. So mm -hmm. um, revenue does solve a lot of problems, but if you are a weak operator with a lot of revenue, as soon as you take a hit on that revenue, you're in trouble. So you got to make sure your numbers are in line no matter what that revenue number is. Yeah, definitely. In your experience, do you find, I know you mentioned that chefs and maybe restaurant managers and people who don't have any business experience are the ones that a lot of times come into restaurants and fail. But do you see um, on, on the whole restaurant operators being good business people or typically no? If you got a good business, yes. If yeah. you've got one that's struggling, no. I'll give you another example, and I think a lot of restaurant operators struggle with this because we hire management staff all the time. I can tell you one out of 10 managers that we interview understand the numbers within the restaurant wow. because the owners don't tell them. So you have someone that you've put in charge of your restaurant, and I'll say, well, what, what, like I remember this one uh, young lady. I said, well, what is your food cost in the restaurant you're at now? She goes, well, we spend about 5000 a week. I said, what does that mean? She goes, well, that's what we spend. That's our food cost. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm asking you what the percentage is of your food costs versus your food sales. And she's like, I have no idea. So you have managers that are supposed to manage your restaurant and they don't even have a clue what they're supposed to be managing. Essentially, you're just having them walk around and touch tables and make sure that people show up and leave on time. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. a lot more education you should give to your good management team if you ever want to be able to get away from your own restaurant and go do something else and let that thing operate on its own. I've got restaurants I don't even go to, right? I don't have to. My team knows the numbers are supposed to hit. They know that are being monitored. Uh, I get my reports every week that show me, so I don't have to step foot in there to know what's going on. Sure. What about on the front end? You mentioned that you had one 
a, a restaurant location that didn't make it. And then you quadrupled down and bought four more. Yep. Are there metrics on the front end that you look at in terms of buying a business? So same thing. I did again. I did a podcast on this. How do you buy a restaurant? <laughs> and it's simple. You give me twenty four months worth of P and Ls on a okay. restaurant, month by month, side by side, right? So that I can look at all twenty four side by side. I'm going to do what we call a trend analysis on your core metrics: food, mm -hmm. labor, liquor, rent over revenue. And I can predict based on those metrics what's going to happen in that business. A lot of times when people go to buy a restaurant, and I literally just told somebody this two days ago, these restaurant brokers will say, oh, well, here's last year's P&L. Last year's P&L doesn't tell me anything. That restaurant could have been at $2 million last year, and right now it's running at 500000 because you literally tanked it. That's not an accurate number. Or you'll see... Well, here's the last year's, but we're giving it to you in one format. I don't want to see one format. I need, I need to see the trend. Is that trend going down? And is it a steep decline, right? Is it level? Plus, I want to see all those percentages, how they stack up. When I bought that first, when I, when I had the first restaurant and it failed, and then I looked at the next four to buy, I looked at a P&L that, this is, you, this is a crazy thing to say, but this guy had $30,000 in bounce check charges in the first 10 months of the year. Wow. <laughs> That's not $30,000 in bounce check charges. <laughs> he was running like a 48% food cost. Yeah. I remember we went in. I said, you're selling wings for a quarter. He's like, yeah, man, it drives a lot of people in. I said, they cost a quarter. Actually, they cost 27 cents. You're losing two cents on every wing. He goes, yeah, but we sell a lot. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. We got to raise the price on wings. He goes, people will stop coming in. I'm like, good. Because <laughs> the more people come in, buy these wings... The more money you lose, you just, he, he was clueless as to how the metrics work behind the business. So, um, yeah, when you're buying a restaurant, we got to look at the 24 months worth of P&Ls. Let's track it, look at the trends, see where the percentages are. And then we can tell you whether that restaurant is, as I said, a gold mine or somebody else's problem. It's pretty easy. When you go to make an offer on a, on a restaurant, do you look at. How, how do you determine the price you're going to pay? Are you looking at, uh, maybe a, a revenue or EBITDA? What are you basing that on? Yeah, so it's going to be EBITDA based, but it's also based on volume or okay. not volume, number of locations. So a single operator unit has a much lower EBITDA than, say, a six or 10 unit operator, right? So if I have a single unit operator doing a million dollars a year at 10% profit, that's 100 grand, right? He's making 100 grand. I'm going to invest maybe $200,000 in buying that. If he gets 2x out of me, he's pretty good because I know. That $100,000 profit that he's making in that location is at risk. It's at risk of him leaving, me taking over, the customers getting mad. I've had that happen. Sales tanked when I took over because the customers didn't like me because they love the old guy. On the other hand, if you've got six to ten locations and you have an operator that's not actually involved in the business, he's not the person, he's not the face, he's not there every day, he's not the people, the person the customers see. Like I, I like to say if I sold my restaurants, nobody would even know. People don't even know I'm the owner, right? That creates value in the business. So if I've got six to ten locations, relatively stable income, where the op the owner isn't the main operator, that's probably worth more like a five or six x over a two x on a single operator location. And then you have to dig into why the person's selling, right? Mm -hmm. I can tell you one I bought. I knew the guy had taken a job that was moving him out of state. I knew that his lease was about to renew and his his franchise agreement was about to renew, and he only had four weeks. If he didn't sell it to me, he was out of business. Wow. So literally, I was not going to offer him very much because I knew he didn't have anything to offer me. It was a good business, but without me buying it, he was going to get zero in four weeks. So we were able to come in at a much, much lower uh, sales price on that kind of deal. So every deal is different. You got to look at them individually. Yeah. That's a good segue into you recently wrote a book called Know the Psychology of Sales and negotiations. I actually purchased the book and read it. It was a great. Oh, read. there you go. Yeah. Look at that. I got my copy too. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So tell me a little background on the book. What was the impetus for starting it? And what are some of the things that a reader can get from reading the book? You know, I've done sales training when I sold my companies in, in 99, 06 and 08, I, I started doing uh, corporate sales management training. I've trained thousands of people, billions of dollars in sales to the teams. Um, and what we what we've really learned through all that is that sales is as much or more about the psychology of the way that the customer or client is thinking 
and less about what the salesman is pitching, right? Too many salespeople fail because they think that sales is about talking for 10 minutes about the benefits of whatever it is they've got, and it's really not. It's about making a connection with a client. It's about figuring out what I call the three whys and a when. You know, why are they buying? Why should they buy your product? Why should they buy from you? And when are they looking? Um, so if you understand the psychology behind the person standing across from you and you build a sales script in your head or a sales process around that psychology, your chances of closing go up like a thousand percent. I mean, it's, it's, it's night and day. Yeah. And in the book, you had 40 different lessons that you've learned and talk about in the book. And there was a few that I really stood out to me. Um, be willing to play the long game. Understand once an offer is made, the next person who talks loses. I love that one. I have yep. a, a mentor in, in the food service industry, and that's what he's always told me. Once you make your presentation and throw out your, your ask, yep. stop talking. Shut up. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Just shut up and wait. I, and so this... The story behind that one, and I got that from Richard Branson because he wrote a book, and one of the things in his book was if your first offer doesn't insult them, you've offered too much. Yeah. Because we call this anchoring the sale, the bottom of the sale, right? So I know in most situations, whatever I'm asking, if the other person's a negotiator, they're going to say no, right? right? And so I know they're going to say no, so I'm going to go high. This is the old high-low game, right? So if I'm if I'm buying, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to try to anchor you. I'm going to whatever you say it is. I'm going to say no. I'm going to drop that price way down. And so the example you're talking about there was literally what I just said a minute ago. So they came to me about a restaurant and they said, the guy wants 300,000. I said, I give him two. And they said, no. And then, so this other guy, Mike bought it. And a year later he came back and said, Mike wants to sell it. He'll sell it for two. And I said, no, I'll buy it for one. And he said, you offered two the last time. I said, that was the last time. And so another year goes by, it's just two years in now. And he comes back, he goes, all right, he said he'll take one. I said, <laughs> okay, I'll I'll take a look at it at one, right? This is called playing the long game. I never get excited about a deal. Deals are a dime a dozen. You have no idea when you say no what might come back to you. So I go in, I look at the deal. We do all the due diligence. I um, get all the numbers, interview the employees. This is when I found out that he had taken another job and he needed to leave. This is when I found out that the landlord – lease had to be re-executed in four weeks. That's when I found out that the franchise agreement was also expiring and he had to re-sign for 10 years in four weeks. And so now I call this blood in the water. I got a guy, there's no way he's going to, there's nobody else buying. So if he doesn't sell it to me, he's going to get nothing. So we get to the table and I'm sitting in the booth at his restaurant and he, and the broker's sitting with me and he said, okay, so are we ready to do this? And I said, I can't give you a hundred thousand dollars. He goes, well, what are you thinking? I said, I'm thinking zero. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I just didn't say anything. And he's looking at me and the broker's eyes got really big. Like, what the hell did he just say? Did yeah. he say zero? And he j we sat there for like two minutes just staring at each other. And I'm not going to say anything because the next person to talk loses. That's right. And finally he goes, I can't take zero. And when he said that, I had him. Yeah, I said, well, I tell you what, I'll buy your inventory, I'll, ref I'll, I'll refund you your lease amount, so you'll get out of here with maybe $25,000. And he goes, I can't take nothing. I said, oh, I'll give you ten grand. Otherwise, I'm out. And he said, all right, fine, I'll take it. So we went from 300 a year later 200 a year later 100 He thought he was closing at 100 I bought it for 10 That is an incredible negotiation. Now, that's not going to work all the time. No. But in this case, I anchored the deal at zero, understanding that I had him, I had him, I had him. Yeah, he no had kidding. no place to go. There wasn't another person uh, out there that was going to deal with deal with him. So it was me or nothing at that point. I couldn't have done that in a different type of scenario, which is why you have to read. I said everything depends on the scenario. In that scenario, I knew I had him over a barrel. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. When I was reading this book over the last couple of weeks, I would sit there. I was reading it at night. My wife and I, we like to read before bed. And there was a couple chapters in here really where you talked about kind of the story you just mentioned and, and really saying no to people within a negotiation. I think a lot of times the the way people think is, okay, and that, and that person wants 200,000. So I'm going to offer 150 and maybe split the difference with them. But you're coming in at just no, it's zero. I like that. Um, and I was actually- Richard Branson. In, that's right, Richard Branson. 
I was actually while reading this book in a negotiation to purchase a company and there was moments where I just said, no, I'm not going to do that. And where typically prior to reading the book, I probably would have had wiggle room and, you know, gave a little bit here, gave a little bit there. But instead I just said, no, I'm not going to no. do this, that, and the other. And it worked out. I, all of the things I said no to, I didn't have to execute on. I, and by the way, I was with Richard Branson two weeks ago on Necker Island and was telling him this story, uh, which is interesting. But it's funny how many people have come back to me and told me the exact same story, right? So I sit on city council here. I'm the liaison for police and fire. So the police and fire people are all kind of under my watch, right? Mm -hmm. One of our majors uh, calls me one day and he goes, man, I finished reading your book. And he goes, this is incredible. I said, oh, yeah. He goes, I've already put it in, in use. I said, well, what happened? He goes, I went in to buy a motorcycle. I walked in and they gave me a price and I said, no, I'm leaving. And he goes, that guy chased me all the way out into the parking lot, lowering the price about every five steps. <laughs> he said, till I got to my car and then I got a hell of a deal on that motorcycle because I just said, no, I'm not going to do that. I said, yep, that's, you just got to say no. And it's yeah. amazing because you know what? The worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to get it for a higher price. Mm -hmm. That's the worst that's going to happen. So why not anchor that sucker as low as you can get it? and go from there. Yeah, that's a really great point. That's a really, really solid point. Um, you had another lessons in another lesson in the book. Um, and that was around read the script. I remember. So this chapter really hit me uh, good. Because I remember when I first started uh, coming out of college, I was actually my senior year of college, I got a job uh, working for free as an intern for a financial advisor for Wells Fargo advisors. And I wanted to be a financial ad advisor at the time. And so he said, come in and you can work as much as you want. So I'd sit there um, each day after school. And he, the first thing he had me do was pull out a piece of paper and a pen and write out a script. And essentially I would, he gave me, he then gave me a list of 600 phone numbers to call and I'd call each one of the, uh, each one of the numbers and go one by one. And I would just follow that script. If they said yes, then I'd go to this. If they said no, yep. then I'd give overcome that objection. I really like that, that, uh, mindset of read the script. It's, it's important for sales managers and sales, sales trainers to understand that if you have somebody that's learning how to sell or they're in sales training, that script is your ability as a sales trainer to be on that phone call or in that presentation without you actually having to be there. Mm -hmm. Because you should know what works. You should know the psychology behind it. You should know how to do it. And so when I get salespeople and I say, read the script, I'm like, well, I, you know, I, I want to do my own thing. And I always say, listen, when you prove to me that you don't need me to help you, then you can ad lib. But until then, say exactly what I'm telling you because I know what I'm telling you works. And so that's what they do. And if they get out there and they start selling, they start changing it. We pull them back out of the sales force, bring them back in, put them in a room and say, here we go. We're going to do it again. And you're going to keep doing this over and over until you finally learn to listen to me. Mm -hmm. Or we call it coaching you up or coaching you out. One of the two. <laughs> I like that. I, uh, in high school, I did my uh, speech for my graduation and going into it, I had no script. And I told the people putting on the event that I'm just going to go out there and wing it. And what I have is what I have. And I was in and out in all of 30 seconds, probably 60 seconds. And <laughs> I was so nervous, uh, you know, I was in front of, I don't know, a thousand people and yep. I've never really had that experience at all. So after that, I'm like, I'm going to just write out the, the speech moving forward and I'm just going to read it until I get to a point where I feel comfortable and I don't need a script anymore. Yep, you role play it. Exactly. And we put salespeople in the hot seat and we make them role play in front of their peers. And I love doing it because all the peers are sitting out there correcting the person on the hot seat. And then when they get on the hot seat, they're like, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. I'm like, yes, I know. That's exactly why we're doing it. So you're getting to see both sides of the equation. And we do it over and over and over until it comes natural. I tell salespeople, salespeople, when I can wake you up out of a dead sleep and you can read this script, that's when you know you're good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No doubt. You had another point too around uh, sell them on an emotion. I really like that yep. thought. I try to do that. I try to research people before going into a presentation to sell them on my company or whatever, whatever I'm trying to sell and learn mm -hmm. about them personally. And can I create some sort of paralleled emotion mm -hmm. um, with them? Because I feel like it really hooks them in a little bit and builds that personal touch. 
Yep. I use this example in sales training, and I love using car salesman as an example, or car sales, because everybody's done it, everybody's been there, and everybody understands it, and it's very simplistic. And I always use the example, when I, if, have you ever been to a car lot to buy a car? Oh, yeah. Before? Okay, so Nick, you've been to buy a car. When you walked on the car lot, and the salesman came up to you, did he hand you the, the manual to the car and say, hey, I need you to read this manual? No. D- did he take you back to the finance department and said, listen, I need you to understand the financing derivatives uh, before we you know, take this car out for a drive? Nope. No. No. He wants to know, what are you looking for? What color, cloth or leather, standard automatic? Hey, man. Hey, Nick, you want to take this thing out for a drive? Mm-hmm. And the reason is he wants you to get in that car and fall in love with it. He wants you to pretend like you're driving by your neighbors showing off your brand new car, you know, feeling like a big shot. If you fall in love with a car, everything else is is just a process, right? Mm-hmm. So anytime you're in a sales situation, you got to make people fall in love with whatever it is that, that you've got. And they don't fall in love with a thousand facts and figures. They fall in right. love with a color, standard automatic, leather, the way it smells, and the way you look driving it down the street, right? So too many salespeople... They, they, they talk themselves out of the sale because they think they got to regurgitate every single thing in the world about what they're doing, and they don't. Mm-hmm. Look, if you're selling food to me, listen, uh, give me a copy of your uh, last couple of bills. I'm going to come back with an analysis. Okay. They come back with an analysis. They say, I can save you 6% on your food purchases going forward. I'm like, okay. They're not breaking the whole thing down. They're not telling me about how their vendors are better. I don't give a crap about how you think your trucks are going to be here on time. No, no. You're going to save me 6%? Okay. Or, Brian, what's the problem you have with your vendor today? Man, they didn't show up last week on a Saturday, and I didn't have any food Sunday morning. We were out of food. I mean, I'm so mad at them. I can't – I like, I want to just drive over to the corporate office and bank. (laughs) Yep, yep, yep. Okay, here's what I can do to help you with that, right? So get them emotional, get them to fall in love with whatever it is, and then go on from there. Too many salespeople talk way too much. I agree, especially I, the salespeople who, after closing a sale, continue to talk after the customer has already said yes. Oh my gosh! Just stop talking and you yes. know sign the paper or whatever it, whatever the next step is to close the deal. Just move on. You got to stop talking. I mean, we just went from a very large food broker starting with an S to a very large food broker starting with a P. Yes, and and I told them no probably three times, and they kept coming back. Okay, let's do a little bit more. Okay, let's do a little bit more. Okay, let's do a little bit more until they got it where it needed to be. And then I was like, let's pull the trigger. Yeah, right? look so, at that. Yeah. I think in my industry, or, or at least in my line of work as a food service broker, a lot of the training that we receive is around just selling the features and the benefits of mm-hmm. the product. Really, what they're trying to say in, in is you know, really the details of the company. The company started in 1925 and these are the products that we sell and it's shipping out here. You know, it's like, yeah, it's just kind of talking points. And, you know, are you really building any kind? What's the other person thinking of when you're saying all of this? Is it even resonating with them? Is it just going one ear and out the other? For those people that can see us on camera, here's what they're thinking. (laughs) I just tilted my head back and rolled my eyes in the back of my head. See if you can't see me. I don't care. I, I tell, see, if they're training that, that's because they're not salespeople and they have fallen into the trap of thinking that people care about the details. They don't care about the details. Details are not what we fall in love with. Yeah. Nobody's handing you the operator's manual to the car. They want you to take it for a drive. That's exactly. the deal. You know, when the, when the food broker says, hey, man, come on into our kitchen. Let's do some experimentation with our, our head chef here and see what we can make some dishes for you. And then if it works out, then we can show you how to buy the ingredients and we'll take care of everything and we'll build build your food costs. And I'm like, cool, we can go into your kitchen. You're just going to start making food for us? Like, yeah, I'm in. Let's go. So these are things that are really super cool we fall in love with. You mentioned on the consulting side working for small and medium-sized companies. Most of them, when you go in, do they have some sort of sales manual or training of any kind? Very few have sales formal sales training. Very few have scripts, and that's why they struggle, right? Well, we, we, we taught Joe how to do X, Y, Z, so he's going to go out and sell. And I'm like, listen, here's what we know. We know that whatever product or service you're selling, and I, I, you'll find this in, in what you do, Nick, as well. There are probably four or five objections that you get 80 to 90% of the time. That's you get true. the same objections every single time. And yet we know what the objection is, and then we fail to create a script or a process around overcoming those specific objections 
until here's what we teach. We teach people you have to overcome objections before the client has them, not at the end of the sales process. If you're overcoming an objection at the end of the sales process, you've already lost me. So if I know what those four or five objections are, I'm going to build a sales process and a script to overcome those objections during the fact finding process before we ever get to the close. And then we use positive affirmations, we use pause for effect, we use check-ins. And so by the time we get to the close, there's nothing to close. I've already closed myself as a customer because you've built the proper script. You've overcome all my objections. I have nothing left to object to. Mm -hmm. If I have nothing left to object to, there's no place for me to go except buy. Yeah, that's a good point. What about in a restaurant? Do you have uh, a script for a waiter, a waitress, or even a host or hostess in terms of talking to a uh, customer? I'll give you a couple. These are my pet peeves, and we, we try to teach this to people. Uh, and they're my pet peeves, and I always tell people, how would you react if it happened to you? And if that's how you would react, then that's how the customer's reacting, right? Mm -hmm. So remember the badass drink we talked about? That's right. I'll give, yeah. you, an, I'll give you another one, and I, I do this a lot, and I'll say, hey, let me ask you something, Nick. I have a question. You're, you're brand new in my restaurant. Mm -hmm. I just hired you. You're going to work for me. I'm going to ask you a couple basic questions. What are the ingredients in iced tea? Uh, it, not ice. a trick question. Yeah. And, and tea. And tea. Ice and tea. If I order an iced tea and you bring me a warm glass of tea with three warm cubes floating around the top, did you bring me a glass of iced tea? No. No. <laughs> you brought me a glass of warm tea. And now I'm upset. The very first thing you did as a server is give me something that's not what I asked for. And now I'm upset. And you walked away, by the way. And I'm now going, hey, hey, can I get a glass of ice? Right? Because you didn't take two seconds to look at that glass of iced tea and say, hey, there's no ice in there. And the excuse is always the same. Well, the tea was just made, it was warm. Okay, well, refill it back up with ice, right? It's giving a customer a good experience. Mm -hmm. And the other one is, and I love this one, when you go to the table, two things. Is the food half eaten and not finished? And if it is, what does that tell you? Nobody comes to a restaurant because they're not hungry. Mm -hmm. Which means if the food, if the hamburger is only half eaten, I promise you there's a problem. I promise. And you got to find that out. Yeah. And so what I always tell people is, as a manager, when you touch a table, hey, how is everything? If they say it was fine, that means it was bad. <laughs> yeah, it's a code word. Good is good. Fine is bad. Oh, it was really good. Okay, excellent. I know she didn't finish that hamburger. What was wrong with it? There was nothing. Come on, don't lie to me now. Nobody comes here unhungry. What was wrong with it? Well... You know, because they don't want to tell you. They just want to leave a bad Yelp review 10 minutes later. Yes. So we got to dig it out. So good is good. Fine is bad. Half eaten is bad. And we got to find out why, even if you got to push and dig in a little bit. And that creates a good customer experience. Well, I don't, I don't want to cause a problem. And I'm, as an owner, I'm like, listen, I need you to tell me what the problem is. Otherwise, how do I fix it? I need you to be happy. Because if you're not happy, you're not coming back. If you leave and cr leave me a bad review... Please, God, tell me the problem so I can fix it now, right? That's mm -hmm. when I need to fix a problem. So good is good, fine is bad, and half-eaten food, there's a problem. There's a, there, and, and a glass of iced tea should have ice in it. Yes. It, this is basic stuff, but it creates a much better experience for the consumer if you just watch for little things like that. Yeah, that's a good point. You threw me off with the iced tea. I was like, oh my gosh, I got what are, uh, what are the chemical compounds in iced tea? And that, <laughs> you're like, it's just ice and tea. I was like, and of course. Tea. <laughs> right. Do you have checks and balances in your restaurant, in your restaurants in terms of food being delivered to the, to the customer, making sure that it's correct on what they ordered? Gosh, we call this the triple failure, right? I did a reel on this a couple weeks ago. If a food, if food comes out wrong, here's, here's what we know. We know the cook did it wrong. We know the expo person didn't check it. And then we have a server or a runner who carried that food all the way across the restaurant, not understanding that it's wrong because they didn't look at the picture or even look at the ticket, set it down on a table and leave, and then have a server come back out only to find out that the thing's wrong also. So this is a triple failure in a restaurant. You gotta take an extra five seconds from the person on the line to the person on the expo to the person that's serving. We have a big board of what the food's supposed to look like right there. I mean, literally right beside expo. All you gotta do is look at the plate and look at the picture. Is that right? Right? So. <laughs> That's a big one because, Nick, every item that comes back into your kitchen costs you 10 more items before you get your money back. I use, the example I use is a $15 hamburger. If I, if I deliver a $15 hamburger to your table and you send it back and I got to throw away and make another one, 
If my restaurant only has a 10% profit on a hamburger, that means I have a $1.50 profit and I have $8.50 of cost, right? So if that hamburger comes back, I've lost $15. To -hmm. recover my $15, I need 10 hamburgers at a $1.50 profit to recover the $15 I lost on that one burger. Lose one, you got to sell 10 more to be broken even. And people go, oh gosh, but the hamburger really only has a hard cost of maybe, you know, $3. I'm like, BS. I got a manager salary, a cook salary, a kitchen manager salary, an expo salary. I got servers. I got managers. I got bartenders. I got rent. I got utilities. I got everything goes into the cost of that burger, not just how much the meat cost. So every item that comes back costs me 10 more items. That's why you take five extra seconds to make sure it's right before you send it out. I like that. It's probably like, uh, I would imagine your alcohol, you know, especially when it comes to shots, you know, ounce, ounce and a half, someone might purchase, but if you have a bartender that is over pouring again, your, your, your liquor cost is eroding your profitability at that point. Yep. You're watching my reels, Nick. I can see you're asking these questions. <laughs> <laughs> so the reels cost one ounce of alcohol bankrupts your business. And we use the example of if a drink normally has an ounce and a half of alcohol and it's a 22% food cost or liquor cost, which I told you earlier, and my restaurant's running, let's say, an 11% profit margin, right? So I have 22% alcohol costs, but I have an 11% overall margin because of all my fixed operating costs. That's at an ounce and a half. If I go from an ounce and a half to two and a half ounces in that drink, my hard cost goes from 22% to 35%, 34%, something like that. It goes up 12 or 13% in my wholesale cost. Now, if my, my liquor cost goes up 12%, by, I only have an 11% profit margin in my restaurant. That one ounce of alcohol took me from an 11% profit to a 1% loss, and now I'm out of business, right? This is why we have to be really, really diligent on monitoring the food cost, liquor costs, and labor costs. Because if I'm only running a 10% or a 15% margin, and my labor cost is an extra 4%, and my food cost goes up 4%, and my liquor cost goes up 4%, that's 12%. I'm now losing money. So it is a very very fine margin line you have to manage all your cost to maintain that profit margin and even an ounce of alcohol can can put you down i'm sure you've seen the show bar rescue with john taffer and that is a big Mm -hmm. problem that these bars have you know they've gotten into these financially difficult situations because you have bartenders uh skimming off the top or they're serving their friends or it's the Mm -hmm. owner who's just giving away free drinks to people that he meets within the bar Um, yep so it's something you have to be very cautious of. So super interesting. John Taffer has a restaurant concept called Taffer's Tavern. And the very first one is across the street from me in Alpharetta. Oh, really? Um, I didn't know that. Yep. So they opened the very first one there. And it is, uh, the entire concept is, uh, let's just say it's not working. Oh, interesting. The guy, the, the guy who rescues restaurants and bars, his isn't working. <laughs> it's not working. Oh, well, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, in in your career, looking far into the future, what do you still want to accomplish? So uh, I do, I do what's, I've I've long pitched in in the world of business. If you're going to go into business, you're either going to be self-employed or you're going to be a business owner. Mm -hmm. And I I get this from Rich Dad, Poor Dad, by the way, is one of of my three main business books that I recommend to people. And self-employed means you've basically created a job for yourself. It's wholly dependent on you right? So if you leave, there's no revenue. Owning a business means that you've built process procedure systems, much like my restaurants I never go to. If I sell them, nobody even knows that I'm gone. That's creating a business, right? The ups and downs on both of those. As a self-employed person, you don't have employees. Right now as a business owner, I have almost 200. As a self-employed person, I can work when I want, where I want, with who I want. As a business owner, I get all kinds of crazies that come in my restaurants, right? Uh, And some of them are not fun people. So there's ups and downs on both, right? Mm -hmm. But as a business owner, I can sell someday and and have an exit. As a self-employed person, I can't. I have always pitched to be a business owner, be a business owner, because you want to create intrinsic value or legacy type wealth building systems. And you can't do that self-employed. So I've done this in all the businesses I've done. I will tell you that we will eventually sell the restaurant chain. And my next chapter in my life is what I'm doing now which is I run this business accelerator I just started called the force multiplier. And I work with businesses, uh, not just in restaurants, but in all types of businesses that I call them one to 10 million revenue Mm -hmm. in helping them either scale up quickly, 
if they're in business and they're not making money or not making enough, teaching them how to build those core metrics and track the, you know, the P&L, reverse P&L analysis. Or if they're looking to exit, show them how to structure their business so that they can get an exit in the next couple of years. So I really, really enjoy working with entrepreneurs, um, helping them succeed, watching them make money uh, and do really cool things. Um, I've sold businesses. I'm good. I honestly don't need to, to, to do another one. So my, my passion in life right now is helping people. I love that. I, I see that a lot with people who are very successful entrepreneurs or business professionals. They get to a point where they say, you know what, the money and that, and that side, it's great. But now I just want to get into the part of helping others find their, you know, dream or American dream. Right. Which is very I was, admirable. Again, I was on Necker Island having a conversation with Richard Branson, for those of you who know Richard Branson. And I, and I made a comment to him. I, I said, you know, when I sold my companies about 15 years ago, I almost lost my motivation for business. I'd worked so hard for so long, dark to dark, seven days a week, busting my ass, cost me a marriage. I sold the business. I made more money than I ever thought I'd make. And I thought I'm done. I'm never doing it again. I lost my motivation. Mm -hmm. And he said, have you got your motivation back? And I said, yeah, but it's different. My motivation back then was that I needed to make money. That was my motivation. I needed to be rich. And today, I, that motivation's gone. My motivation today is I want to help and watch other people. And I'm going to make a lot of money in the process of doing that. I'm not trying to be ultra, too altruistic here, but I want to watch and help other people make money and do the same things that I did because that is really cool. Sure. I've got a fun question. It has nothing to do with restaurants, nothing to do with food service. How the heck did you get together with Richard Branson? So uh, he hosts different groups on the island, on Necker Island, which is where he lives. And I have a friend here in Atlanta, and she just sold her company, and she's been going to this event every year for like 20 years. She has known that Richard is one of the four people I want to meet in the world. It's Richard Branson, Elon Musk, Kenny Chesney, and Peyton Manning. By the way, if anybody knows Peyton Manning, <laughs> Kenny Chesney, or Elon Musk can hook me up, you're my best friend for life. Yes. She knew Richard. So she called me. She said, I'm, I'm speaking at this event on Necker Island next week. Uh, would you like to come? And I was like, are you freaking kidding me? I've sailed around Necker Island, never been on it. And Richard's going to be there. She said, yeah, it's his birthday. I'm like, I'm there. So this was a giant bucket list event for me. Got to spend time with him every day for five days. Had great conversations. Hell of a guy. So super fun. That's what a once in a lifetime opportunity. 100%. Although I'm going next year. So it'll be twice in a lifetime. <laughs> I'm, jealous. I'm jealous. I get to go back. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, unfortunately, I don't know Peyton Manning uh, or Elon Musk or Kenny Chesney, but uh, maybe someone right. listening along does. Somebody in the audience, hook me up, man. Let's exactly. do it. <laughs> if you can go back to your time in high school, coming out of high school, what advice would you give to yourself? Remember, I failed high school as I was 16. That's right. And I came from a very rough childhood. I had a chip on my shoulder the size of a Volkswagen BMW. I was an angry young man. Uh, all I wanted to do in life was succeed and prove to the world that I wasn't the loser that I thought everybody thought that I was. This, we're getting into some psychology here, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was driven from the age of 18 a thousand percent to build a business, succeed, build a business, succeed, make money, be successful, buy things. That was my only drive. I can tell you that I was I did not spend as much time with my children as I wish now that I would have, and it ended up costing me a marriage. And if I could go back to that person back then, I would say, listen, relax. It's going to be okay. You need to spend more time with your family. Don't be so consumed with success that you lose everything that's important in your life. And that's the advice I would give myself. That's a great, I like that. Uh, that, that really resonates. You know, I, my wife and I, we got married just about a year and a half ago. We've been married. We've been together though for 12 years. And one of my goals, my professional goals is I don't want to have, I know that success will come because I'm only 30 at this point. Success will come in my life. And I want to be able to be married to Carly my mm -hmm. entire way through. Um, so it's important to me. And I really like your advice of just relax because sometimes you get caught up in the moment, uh, especially when you're trying to grow a business and you know, you have your successes and your failures and it's easy to get caught up in the negatives, but it's important. We are men, to relax. we are warriors. We think we're supposed to go out and conquer the world. And you think you're doing your job as a man by, by succeeding. 
And I can tell you when we sold our companies and I said, hey, we win. I mean, we have all the money we're ever going to need. Let's go enjoy the rest of our lives and party. And she's like, you have not been nice to me for the past 15, 20 years. I don't want to do it with you anymore. Mm -hmm. And that was tough, yeah. you know. So you've you've won the world and lost what was really important. Don't do that. Yeah. Well, I, Brian, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to come on the Titans of Food Service podcast. I really enjoyed our conversation. For those listening, how can they connect with you? Where can they find your new book? <laughs> What's the best way to, to find Brian Will? This is easy. It's brianwillmedia.com. brianwillmedia.com. Okay. My books, my podcasts, my coaching, everything about me is on there. Uh, if you want to talk, drop me a message, set up a, a call, whatever you want to do, brianwillmedia.com. That's where I am. Excellent. Brian, thank you so much. Nick, it's been awesome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you.